Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this webinar dedicated to supporting growers coming out of the COVID-19 crisis. This uh, session is an initiative of Flora Culture International Magazine and the International Organization of Horticultural Producers. Uh, we are delighted that they have asked us, uh, Jungle Talks, to facilitate uh, this session. My name is René Snijders, and next to me... Is Ed Smith. My name is Ed Smith, and we've been organizing webinars for already some six years now. Uh, we've had greater webinars uh, before Corona, but this time it's a special one. We've got a record. We've got 48 uh, countries, people registered from 48 countries online, and that's a new for us. So, yeah, we, we are happy to, uh, to see you all online. Um, we hope everybody can hear us. We hope everybody can see us. Uh, if you can't, please use the orange arrow on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, a dashboard will pop up, and that dashboard will guide you. You can uh, download the handouts in that dashboard. You can adjust your camera. Uh, you can ask questions. Please do. If you have any questions for one of the for our keynote, Mr. Charlie Hall, for the others, please do. And um, yeah, you will receive afterwards. You will receive a link. Uh, of this session so if you couldn't make it then you can always look at uh, look at it afterwards yeah uh, as i mentioned already uh, it's a pleasure ed said it as well it's a pleasure to present uh, today and that is uh, not in the least because of today's guests um maybe uh, very quick um we start with uh, uh, tim briercliff the secretary general of um the international uh, organization for floral cultural producers uh, then a brief word from Ron van der Ploeg, editor of Floriculture International magazine. And then we go to our keynote speakers uh, today. Uh, first up, uh, Dr. Charlie, Dr. Charlie Hall, Allison Chair in International Flori <coughs> Culture, Texas A&M uh, University. He will outline the approach that growers need to take in reviewing their businesses and determining next steps during these unprecedented times. Uh, we will then uh, continue with uh, the stories of two uh, professionals in floriculture. Uh, we'll listen to Twan Overgaag, Director President of um, <clears throat> Westerlee Orchids, and we'll listen to Ari van den Berg of Vandenberg Roses, uh, a truly international rose grower with subsidiaries in uh, the Netherlands, Kenya, and also China. After their stories, we will moderate questions from the audience. So, uh, as I already mentioned, don't be shy. Please send us your questions so we can send them on and moderate them for uh, Dr. Wolf, for Tuan, and for Ari. Um, I think it's time now Ed, to connect with, uh, with Tim Briefcliff. Let's see if he's uh, with us. Uh, Tim, can we hear and see you perhaps? Yes, yeah, Tim, you here you are. Hello. Do you can hear me? Hello. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have us with you. Um, can you explain maybe to the audience very briefly um, why you're organizing this event? Yeah, hello. Uh, it's great to have everybody uh, involved on this webinar and it's a real um, great time for us to have this first uh, webinar. So thanks very much to Rene and Ed for their support in helping to pull this together and to our our speakers today, Charlie, Juan, and Ari, thank you to them. Thank you to uh, Green Tech also, who have helped us in uh, promoting the event. And uh, we really give you a welcome. I hope this is a really uh, useful session for all of you. Please do let us know about that as well. Um, you know, through this time of COVID-19, we have all faced the same challenge, which is really unusual for the whole world to face the same problem at the same time. And as an industry, we've had to deal with it, and so it's a good opportunity now for us to come together to be able to share uh, together our own experiences and from growers and from experts to, to share so we can together move forward. A little bit of introduction on AIPH. Um, uh, we are the world's champion for the power of plants. Our, uh, our members um, uh, exist in many countries around the world and we are there to uh, stimulate demand for ornamental trees, plants and flowers, to protect and promote our industry, to be the place where the industry comes for information and knowledge exchange and to promote best practice in the sector. Next slide. 
so we have members all from all over uh, the world, and uh, we are members get together. There are generally the full members are associations that represent growers in different countries. We come together twice a year. Uh, next slide, please. And we are active in a number of different areas, uh, which might be of interest to you. We uh, have the role of approving international horticultural exhibitions around the world, including the likes of the Floriada, which will take place in the Netherlands in 2022. And last year we had the Expo 2019 Beijing. We also have approved Green Tech and a number of other uh, trade exhibitions as well in the industry. We work on Green City, looking at promoting the use of plants, flowers, trees in the city areas for improving health and environment and well-being. And we seek to support growers uh, around the world on issues, technical issues, environmental issues, plant health, novelty protection, and so on. We also uh, have a group for flower auction markets, and we uh, publish an annual statistical yearbook, and we publish the Floriculture International magazine, which we'll hear about in a moment. Next slide, please. Uh, that's the statistical yearbook I mentioned or didn't mention, but we also run the International Grower of the Year Awards. And uh, so uh, and this is our statistical yearbook, which is uh, been published now for 67 years. So we're getting used to doing it. Next slide, please. Um, in order to support the industry through COVID-19, we have a section of our website dedicated specifically to this. So if you go to the AIPH website, we have a resource center, which includes fact sheets on how to promote the importance of the scientific evidence of why plants and flowers are good for you to have in your home. The reasons why gardening is good for people during this time including much of the research which Charlie will uh, has been involved in producing over the years as well. Um, we also have other, we have done surveys of the industry as well to find out the impact of the pandemic on the sector and also recommendations for, for what will, what, 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 uh, predictions of what will happen in the future from different countries. Next slide, please. Uh, if you, uh, uh, well, this year we can't run our physical conference, so we're going to be running a, our major annual congress uh, as an online event on the 15th of September. Uh, please do have a look on the website and you can join that. It's going to be a 3D interactive uh, event and uh, you can uh, be a part of it and we will, it'll be a full day event that you can dip in and out of looking at. Uh, recovery from crisis and uh, we'll look at the cut flower sector and then in the container grown plant sector also later in the day and uh, for some of you it might mean a very early morning for some a very late evening but there'll be a great program in there yeah. next slide so that was a summary from me about AIPH and uh, we're really pleased to have you with us today and now I'm going to pass over to uh, Ron who's going to talk to you about Floriculture International magazine yeah Ron let's see if we can uh, turn yeah, on your yeah that you turn on your microphone as well so we can hear you we can see you already thank you Ron, it seems that you're self-muted. Please turn on your microphone so we can also hear you. If you, I hope that it works. Ron, you have to click on your microphone and uh, we can't do that from here. Yeah. So Ron, please, because otherwise uh, I, Tim takes over for you, I think. <laughs> I take over. Okay, no problem. So uh, we can't hear Ron at the moment. Ron is the editor of uh, FCI magazine, um, and uh, we publish this every as a ma magazine every two months. And the latest one has just come out. It's free to subscribe to, and we seek to cover off all the issues facing the floriculture industry, ornamental plant supply chain across the world. And also, you will find the information on the, the website, floriculturinternational.com. And we hope that we will be able to bring more events like this to you as we expand our activity online as well. 
I think Ron would have told you more about that summary. Yeah. Is the sound on? Yeah, the sound is on. Yeah, sound on. Okay. But yeah, well, this okay. did an excellent job for you, but we hear you. Anything okay. to add, uh, Ron? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Tim, for this very comprehensive overview. Live from the Netherlands, uh, a warm welcome uh, to the webinar. Allow me, please, to say uh, a few quick words on uh, Florida Culture uh, International, the business magazine, which is also known as FCI. My name is Ron van der Ploeg. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm born the son of a rose grower and actually uh, my father's business was only uh, a few blocks away from, uh, the, from the Berg family, uh, which today is represented by Adi van der Berg, which is, uh, who is one of the keynote speakers. Since 2008, I'm editor of the magazine, um, which was founded 30 years ago. Uh, today, uh, FCI is uh, one of the leading trade publications uh, on uh, floriculture. Uh, English language, uh, and it combines a paper and online readership uh, of uh, 60,000 in 60 countries worldwide. Um, we at Florida Culture International um, are very keen and we do our utmost to ensure a qualified readership. So actually we establish partnerships uh, with trade associations and grower associations in, around the world. Uh, and the benefits of this is a free uh, digital uh, copy of the magazine and online access. FCI is the place uh, where industry professionals go to for the latest news. Uh, we report on trade shows, uh, conferences, webinars, uh, uh, but we also do uh, in-depth interviews and uh, special features on crop protection, logistics and so on. Uh, our team uh, uh, includes correspondents around the world, and my colleagues in the UK, uh, Angie Duffrey, Rachel Wakefield, and Olvi Gerber, uh, are, including myself, of course, are more than happy to welcome you among uh, our international leadership. Last but not least, I would like to thank you for being with us today, tonight, this evening, or this morning, whatever time zone you will be. And for now, I think uh, there's uh, little uh, left to say, uh, only that Rene, take it away. Yeah, thanks, uh, Ron. I'm, I'm glad that the microphone was working. We're going to our first uh, speaker, Dr. Charlie uh, Hall. I just uh, briefly introduced him at the, the beginning. He is uh, the Ellison Chair and working at Texas A&M University already for quite a while now. Um, it's, it's really a great pleasure uh, to have uh, his expertise here at um, this webinar, not only um, his, his uh, real life experience, so to say, in the sector, but also, of course, um, uh, that he's able to share his academic research uh, with us today uh, and that he can discuss strategies and actions uh, with the professionals that follow him, with Juan and with Ari. So uh, let's see, Dr. Hall, if we can hear and see you. We'll see you. Oh, yeah. Everything is fine. Uh, so I would say, like Ron said to me, take it away. The floor is all yours. All right. Thank you very much, Renee. And good morning, or should I say, hello, uh, bonjour, buenos dias, ni hao. Well, I better stop there. There's 48 countries. I don't have time to say hello in all 48 languages. But good morning. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to be a part of this uh, international event. My topic is very straightforward. I'm going to discuss the impacts that COVID-19 has had on the green industry, but more specifically, how we as, as green industry uh, owners, managers, operators uh, within our respective countries, what is the response that as a leader we need to make in the middle of these types of crises? And surely uh, we haven't seen this type of disruption within the, the green industry supply chain since the Great Recession. And now we're in the midst of the great shutdown. And so the impacts have been very dramatic and they've been very immediate. And at the same time, for our industry, they have been mixed. In fact, I have been asked by, by many uh, about the nature of that impact. And I, I've said in response that it's very difficult to simply say it's been good or it's been bad because it has been good for some and it has been bad for others. And however, 
in the midst of crises, there are opportunities. And I think you'll hear that from the growers that will be on uh, after my remarks. In terms of the opportunities that they saw in the marketplace and how they are structuring themselves to take advantage of those opportunities. So with that, uh, let's, let's go to the next slide. Now, I, I said leadership in the crucible of crisis, right? That's, that's, I didn't, that's not my catchphrase. That's been around for a long time. But a crucible really just mashes whatever's in the crucible together. And surely firms within the green industry have been squeezed and smashed from all sides and during the midst of COVID-19. Now, as leaders, it's important to follow these principles, I think, in the midst of crisis. And that is, you have to lead not only from the head, which we would normally do. We have our departmental metrics that roll up into critical numbers for our business. And then those critical numbers help us to achieve some some three to five year financial targets, whether it be net profit margin, return on investment, or et cetera. However, in the midst of crises, leaders, true leaders, exercise a degree of empathy. That is, they, they try to put themselves in the shoes of their customers, in the shoes of their employees, in the shoes of all stakeholders in the company. That's a very important perspective, right? And it's more, then it's simply a short run perspective. It's a longer run perspective. Now, speaking of the longer run, most companies that are represented here, most entities would have a mission statement. Um, and I say the second principle that resilient leaders should exercise is that they should also put the mission first. Remember that core purpose. And I, I like using that terminology core purpose uh, rather than mission statement, right? Because the core values in which we base our business and that core purpose, that raison d'etre, the reason that we are in business really comes into play in the midst of crises. That when we're, we're squeezed by the circumstances of the crisis, oftentimes what we stand for and the why that undergirds our businesses really comes to the forefront. And uh, you know, there's, a, there's a really famous TED talk by Simon Sinek that talks about um, start with why, right? People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Well, it's important to convey the why in the midst of crises. Now, the third element that leaders in a crisis should exhibit is speed right? Able, being able to respond quickly is, is a, a key success factor. In fact, many businesses I would describe as the Titanic. There's these huge monolithic uh, the shapes that we're trying to, to navigate the waters of the market, and that's anything but being speed and, and, and being able to respond quickly, right? So in the midst of crisis, we have to respond quickly with the imperfect information, right? We don't have, I, I'm an economist. And so the economic data in which we can make base decisions are really lagging indicators. And we were, I was, I was being asked, what, what's this crisis look like from an economic standpoint? And we didn't have the data yet. So that's, we oftentimes have to make decisions without perfect data. Fourthly, own the narrative. If you do not tell your story in the midst of the crisis, you can't expect anyone else to tell it for you. And as Tim was talking, that one of the missions of AIPH is to emphasize the benefits of plants. And I, I wrote a series of journal articles uh, for the Journal Environmental Horticulture last year on just the health and well being benefits of plants. This was a health crisis and here we are we are positioned to really capitalize on that and to emphasize on the shout it from the mountaintops about the health and well-being benefits that flowers and plants provide to the citizens or worldwide so it was it was a chance for us to own that narrative 
And as companies, every company and entity represented on the webinar today, you have a story to tell. And those stories are oftentimes heroic in the midst of crises. However, if you don't tell the story, no one else do. And then lastly, leaders in the crucible of a crisis should embrace the long view. Don't focus on short-term profits, right? That's the wrong thing to focus on in the short term. Yes, cash management is imperative. Yes, managing working capital is imperative. Making sure you're not over leveraged, taking the doing some lean flow and, 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 and exercising lean management and making sure your value proposition is set. All those things are important, but in the long run, you've got to anticipate that there's going to be business models that are going to be shifting and occurring. And just today in the news, we heard of a bouquet manufacturer purchasing another large uh, growing operation in Latin South America. So there are structural changes that are going to be occurring within the marketplace. Now, as business leaders, I love this graphic. I found it in a report by McKinsey and Company, so it's not mine. I give them the credit, but it shows that the different um, mindsets that business leaders should have in the short run, namely, we should be looking at the depth of the of the disruption, right? How, what, what are, how are consumers uh, spending their precious dollars or, or yen or whatever, what their, their precious currency, how are they spending that? Are they spending it on durable goods or are they spending that on food and clothing and cleaning supplies and so forth? That's, that's, those are important questions. Secondly, we need to look at the length of the disruption. How long will the disruption last? And of course, if you look at stock markets around the world, they have been surprisingly bullish in the midst of this crisis that may turn uh, as this crisis continues, but we'll see. And then lastly, the shape of the recovery. Is it going to be a V-shaped, a U-shape, or more of a hockey stick where we a long, short uh, decline and then a long recovery. Well, right now we don't know the answer except it's not gonna be a V-shaped recovery worldwide. I think it's more of a, a inverted square root symbol where we, we, were, we were here before the, the great shutdown and then we dropped precipitously and we'll have a small V-shaped recovery, but then a, a longer recovery that'll get us back to where we were. So that's that's my own personal view as an economist. Obviously the shape of that economic recovery is correlated with the COVID-19 recovery. And you can see in this chart, I've included worldwide statistics for South America, Asia, uh, North America, Europe, Africa, China, and really Europe is, is the leaders within the world in terms of recovering from the coronavirus, right? And you, you can see that obviously China's way down here, but Africa has been increasing. Other uh, parts of Asia besides China have been increasing. Satin, uh, South America, oh my word, Brazil, just skyrocketing in terms of cases. And then after attempting to reopen here in the United States, we see Again, a surge in upward surge in cases. So this recovery is by no means over with, and we're this is going to take a long time for us to recover fully from COVID. And we have to make sure to maintain solvency and liquidity within world markets in the meantime. Now, as an example, as an anecdote, here in the US, when I said earlier, I can't really describe that the in, the industry has been favored or that it's been hurt by COVID-19 because both are true. That they're, they're, here's the US growers and these are sales by week. And you can see that as time went on, there were fewer growers whose sales were up year over year compared to last year. And um, there were, there were fewer growers whose sales were down. In other words, 
the situation improved as we went from February, March, April, May, and June. Sales generally increased, but in the end, by the June 10th, which is the last time I collected this data, sales for 68% of the growers in the U.S. were up. 9% of the growers experienced flat sales, and then 24% were down. So again, this has been a very mixed type of crisis. Some have benefited while others have been hurt. Now, that's the short run. Let me postulate some longer term impacts of COVID-19, because I think if we can imagine some of those structural changes, then we'll see the opportunities. And one of those has been, I think there's gonna be a permanent behavioral shift to online purchasing and delivery. And this is across customer segments, but particularly for our citizens who are more experienced. I don't like saying old people, right? But citizens of more experience, um, they, much like their younger counterparts, all of a sudden engaged in online shopping. And I don't think that's gonna go away anytime soon. Secondly, I think there's gonna be some longer term shifts in the supply chain. Um, we saw, particularly on the cut flower side, some major disruptions within the supply chain and our ability to both transport flowers by truck and certainly by hour, right? And I know that there's some there's some folks uh, online that have been heavily involved in this industry, this side of the industry for a long time. And, and you saw some structural changes for the first time. You, you saw major shifts by trucking companies and airlines in terms of how they've reacted to this crisis. And I think, no, I know there will be additional structural changes that will occur in the supply chain we will no longer focus on just getting inputs from one supplier, but we will know our supplier's supplier, and we will make sure that we mitigate that supply chain risk in the supply chain. Next, I think we'll have a new understanding of who essential workers are. And essential workers are not just top management, but those frontline employees, right? And we need to make sure within our companies that we recognize where the pinch points, where the, the problem areas might be where we don't have a backup. So we need to make sure that at all key positions within our business, we have training and cross training across departments so that one person can plug into a different position and fill the void in the short run if need be, right? So we're gonna see a lot more uh, changes in terms of security, in terms of vendor relationships, and in terms of managing our workforces in the future. Also, I think companies will exhibit a great deal more corporate citizenship and that they will be more concerned about the environment, more concerned about uh, what is a equitable wage uh, what is a, a livable wage, if you so, if you uh, want to use that term, and that we recognize those frontline employees, those essential workers, and, um, and that we shine a spotlight on them. Now, there will also be some realignment of work from distance, and that uh, I myself have been teaching classes from the university from right here in my home office right? Major structural shift. And that'll continue through the next semester this fall. But uh, even th those of you who are online that are not in the educational system, I mean, you had to make changes. And sometimes your accounting people, salespeople, they said, don't bother coming into the office, you can work from home. And I think we'll see that we didn't lose a lot of efficiency. You know, I myself, even though I've been working in my home office, I've been working longer hours in the midst of this, so able to do a, a lot more. Now, so there's a lot of social capital that's built up when companies do the right thing in the middle of these crises and uh, going beyond the fear of the unknown, companies have used social media 
and other tools to both influence customers and their employees to educate and to make people more aware, right? And that awareness, as I said down at the bottom of this slide, definitely should include the benefits of plants that we provide to society. So I think we have we can use social media to build our social capital as an industry. And then lastly, um, there have been various relief programs that have been passed by not just the US, but in Germany and all across Europe, South America, different governments have utilized selected tools, financial tools to help bolster their industries. And there will likely be some tax implications and some regulatory implications that come from that. So those are some of the major implications, but one of the most important is that I think this crisis will finally allow us to do some skew rationalization. And what I mean by that, the skew is a storekeeping unit and that's, uh, that's the number of products, the different sizes of products, the number of products that we have in our portfolio. And supermarkets uh, went from like 40,000 different products in supermarkets to 20, 25,000 because they focused on the essential products. They focused on those. So I think that's important to remember that we have an opportunity not to produce every single plant in the world, but to focus on what we do best and to focus on the core, the core products, the core markets, the core customers. We can even select customers based off of how they responded to COVID-19, whether or not they canceled our contracts in the middle of the crisis or whether they stuck with us and still used our product. Now, my last slide. This is another McKinsey slide, but it's a five R's. I think it, it's very powerful in really setting a stage for the rest of our discussions and talking about the, the, moving from the left to the right. When COVID first hit, we needed to have the resolve to make the changes to ensure the survivability of our businesses. No doubt, we needed to save cash. We needed to do a lot of things. And then we exercise, once we got past the fear stage, we exercised the second R and we started becoming more resilient in terms of these cash management changes and the different structural changes within our supply chain. We responded, we became more resilient. Now we're at a pivotal moment in time that we're trying to return to some semblance of normal. We're trying to return to getting back to making some money, to getting back to having a, a stable, consistent supply in the supply chain. And we need to have some plans for, uh, uh, for scaling our business back quickly when that opportunity affords itself. Now, the next stage I think is very critical. And I'm at this stage in many of my discussions with with uh, growers that are in my executive edu education, um, the reimagining of the new normal, the new new normal. See, the Great Recession forced a no new normal on us. The Great Shutdown will force a new new normal. What does that look like in terms of supply chain? What does that look like between relationships between companies along the vertical path in that supply chain? I think we need to reimagine how we do business as a horticultural industry. I think we need to reimagine how we overcome plant blindness. And then lastly, reform. We gotta be very clear that there will be some regulatory changes, there'll be some competitive environment changes, and we have to be able to respond to those. And so while this looks like a linear path, it, it is somewhat circular in that as we reimagine and as we reform, we'll have to become more resilient and, and, and scale up our businesses quickly. And this is more of an iterative process rather than a linear process. So with that, that's my last slide and I'll, I'll unshare my slides and, and answer any questions. Thank you, uh, 
Dr. Hall, so much for this uh, for this presentation. Very enlightening, and um, we always think also that the last slide um, puts things in perspective, and it also shows that although we're slowly getting out of the crisis in some countries, uh, we are based in Costa Rica. We're still in the midst of it, and um, that is something that um, uh, will also um, that will also show the um, uh, the stories of the next uh, the next um professionals that will that are with us so um let's see if we can um connect with Tuan because also looking at the time uh, dr hall i would like to uh save the, the questions for later yeah and uh, hear the story of Tuan uh, first uh, and see if it works to connect Tuan, we just, already see you just a short introduction to Tuan. Tuan Overgraag is uh, Overgraag. The name says it all, the surname. It's, that's a Dutch surname. Uh, Westerle is a very small village uh, where he was born um, uh, in the Westland area. And it's also the name of his company. His father started, uh, I think it was when in the early 70s uh, in California with producing roses. And about 20 years ago, switched to um, to orchids. Uh, Tuan is a member of an international study club of uh, leading orchid growers around the world. Some of them have, elect, have been elected for the International Grower of the World, mm -hmm. uh, Grower of the Year Award. Some of them have even uh, received it. Uh, Tuan, you did not, you've not been selected yet, but I think <laughs> after this presentation, who knows? Who knows? The floor is all yours. I'll make you the presenter right now and let's see if this works. uh Tuan, sorry there we go yeah can yeah you hear me? yeah we can hear well, that's, you um, it's a lot of pressure between that and dr hall's uh presentation so. <laughs> i'm just gonna fly through it and hope you guys don't no, do my we best we don't see the presentation yet yeah um maybe you can share your screen yes. one. there we go here we go yeah good luck okay one moment please Okay, just get this started here. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is about 7.30 in the morning here in California, and I'm sure uh, many different time zones out there. So good evening, good afternoon, good night, I guess. Uh, we're Westerly Orchids. As um, Ed said, he, what he left out is actually that uh, we were neighbors, but I'm a few years younger than him, so I don't really have any recollection. Uh, we're located in Santa Barbara County, um, about an hour and a half drive north of Los Angeles. Um, we produce uh, potted orchids for the supermarket uh, uh, segment mostly, uh, about three million a year. We are on a, on a growth path. Uh, we, uh, six hectare greenhouse, 125 employees. And uh, we really like to focus on being the most reliable producer in our market, uh, our sustainability efforts and really being trend focused uh, to, to present the product as a home decor item. Um, heading into the crisis, uh, we were in quite a strong position. Uh, we'd been seeing some pretty solid growth in business uh, and had been planning a pretty um, significant expansion. And I think a uh, strong balance sheet, um, not carrying a lot of debt, uh, and very important to note, coming in with a very good leadership team. I have six people reporting into me um, for different functions from sales to production to finance and all really talented people, everybody on the same page. And I think that makes a huge difference. Um, I think probably the strongest management team uh, in terms of experience and people that I've had in the 20 years running this business and certainly very grateful for them um, and their performance as we went through everything that we've gone through and are still going through. Um, I kind of cut the crisis, uh, this presentation, I looked at Dr. Hall's uh, draft and, you know, I followed some of what he he's talking about in his model <clears throat> and I try to cut it in a couple different stages here, three real stages. The first is, um, you know, the, the economy just really hitting the brakes, stores calling us, canceling POs and realizing that the first thing we need to do is preserve cash. Uh, a friend of mine who went through a very bad experience um, business experience years ago that he survived said the, the 
the most helpful thing he did was to budget the worst case scenario that he could survive and plan around that. So we did that, uh, which assumed about 60% of regular revenues for several months. Um, we also, uh, we cut our labor force immediately by 20%. Um, we moved our accounts payable, not something we like to do. We like to always pay 15 to 30 days, depending on the vendor. Uh, we had to move that to 60. Uh, we applied for and received the Paycheck Protection Program here in the United States. So we did receive, um, after a couple of weeks of trying to get through the bureaucracy, um, the US government did do a very good job, I believe, in getting out money to companies very quickly. So we did apply for and receive that loan. Um, we did make some symbolic cuts. You know, we do uh, birthday lunches, we do coffee for everybody on Friday, things like that we had to cut. Um, what we did not cut and you know, you're looking at your budget, hey, a place you can save money right away is by cutting uh, some long-term expenditures. Uh, for example, we were in the middle of, of retrofitting some uh, greenhouses uh, that we were entered into a long-term lease on in order to expand our production. And there was a conversation, should we stop doing that? We could really save some money quickly, but that's going to draw, that's going to, that's where our revenue is going to come from. That's going to get us out of this and recover in the long run. So we made the decision not to do that. Um, oops, sorry guys. Um, this second part of the first stage of the crisis is employee safety and communication. And I can't, uh, we are very, very serious about this and still are, you know, we are constructively paranoid. Uh, it's an invisible enemy, as someone has said, and uh, we want, we emphasize employee safety over business concerns. Um, so initially breaking out into small groups, trying to communicate our hygiene uh, protocol, uh, all the usual things that pe people are doing. I think something that we did, um, I don't wanna call it innovative, but it's something that um, we came up with ourselves. I think a lot of people came up with as well, is we broke out our teams. <clears throat> it, we broke out into work teams um, by production area. And then with each production area, isolating people by an orange team and a green team such that if anybody uh, in a team gets sick or gets um, has been exposed, everybody has to isolate and quarantine, but that there's other people who can take up the slack uh, in the short run. And we've actually had a couple of uh, scares that we've had to uh, use that for. We did uh, Im implement a work from home policy and for a lot of the sales staff that, uh, excuse me, the office staff that has been available, uh, obviously in greenhouse production, that's not available. Uh, we expanded our sick leave dramatically. That's um, initially, there's a lot of confusion about how much the government is going to be supporting that. But uh, the way we feel about it with that money uh, for the PPP loan, uh, we're using that largely to say, hey, anybody gets sick, anybody has to quarantine, you're staying home, you're getting paid. Um, and uh, communicating now, uh, initially daily, and now uh, a couple times a week on just hygiene tips. We have a group text app um, that we started using a couple years ago when we had wildfires around here, and we felt like we needed to be in constant communication with our employees. So we've been utilizing that system, and everybody's got a phone, so that works quite well. Um, you know, we moved in after a couple of weeks, you know, you have to kind of go back to where you were emotionally at that time. And I think we all were uh, of that sort of first couple of days of, of, of panic and sleepless nights. And what am I going to do? Am I, what's going to happen to my business? You realize, you know, especially as a leader of a business, you have to stand up, you have to stand in front, you have to get the word out and you got to get people aligned. Um, we came up with uh, a rally and cry. First we survive, then we thrive. Translates very well into Spanish for our Spanish-speaking uh, employees. Uh, primero sobrevivir y después uh, prosperar. And we, around that, we developed four, four short-term goals that we kept emphasizing and kept talking about. Posters, texts, videos going out. Um, first, no one here would catch COVID-19 on premises. That is no community spread here. Um, that we'd match or exceed 60% of uh, Q2 revenues from last year. That's what we felt like we absolutely had to do to keep our heads above water. Uh, and at the time, you know, we did, you know, I'm going to, uh, uh, spoiler alert, we did a lot better than that. But at the time that felt like, hey, that was going to be a stretch. We were going to have to work really hard to get 60%. Um, and as I said, the, the build out the new facility, 
And then also, very importantly, up front, we were we realized we weren't going to be able to sell everything. And I didn't want to start throwing plants away. So we came up with an either donate or recover plan uh, where we might even be able to regrow some of the plants, but really donate quite a few. So in the second stage of the crisis, we also started talking about creating new opportunities. And this donation plan, uh, we rallied around this idea of a $100,000 orchid challenge. Uh, we were looking at 700,000 orchids over a couple of months that we felt like might be in danger of not selling. So we said, hey, let's let's start donating. And we literally on, on, a, on a weekend started calling a bunch of local hospitals and also down in Los Angeles and started getting into their donation departments or whatever logistics department was required and saying, you know, we see you guys on the news. You guys are all working extremely hard. People must be extraordinarily stressed and worried about their families. We want to show our appreciation. We have these orchids we can't get rid of. And we just started packing trucks full, uh, semi loads full of orchids and shipping them these, these hospitals. Um, and uh, so we uh, donated 91,000 orchids actually before the market picked up. And, you know, if we do hit another dip, uh, we've got some other folks lined up to, to finish this effort. Um, but at the end of this presentation, there'll be a short video about our donation program. Um, another thing we did um, that I could spend quite a bit of time on, but I, I realized that we don't have that much time, is we had never really done online sales, but we developed something called boxoforchids.com, which basically took our uh, shipping boxes for the uh, supermarket channels, you know, anywhere from an eight pack to a 15 pack, and we started shipping these out uh, to consumers or anybody who wanted them. And we saw the viability of this. And I've never been a big fan of single shipper um, online. I think that's a really busy and very competitive market, direct to, uh, direct to consumer. But we're thinking direct to some consumer, but also direct to, um, to other businesses, to wholesale. Uh, this is a business model. And, and we think that can actually be a significant part of our business in the future. A third leg of uh, uh, creating new opportunities is realizing we we barely had any presence on law, uh, with social media prior to um, the COVID-19 crisis. And we're seeing the incredible responses that we were getting to Instagram stories, to my personal LinkedIn page, um, and realizing that there's a real opportunity to create brand awareness and to drive customers uh, to the different sales channels that we have. Uh, and that's something that we've really um, creating a, a, a company-wide goal around. Um, third stage, so, you know, survive and thrive. So we really feel like, at least for the time being, I wanna be very careful to say the time being, we're uh, switching to a thrive mode. You can see here from this chart, from week 11 through 16, and well, actually it was week 19, a major slump in business. The gray bars representing really uh, dollars and the yellow bar, or excuse me, the yellow line representing a percentage and realizing of course that, um, you know, through week 18, our biggest shipping, 17 and 18, our biggest shipping days for Mother's Day, uh, being significantly down and Easter being a real beating. And now, frankly, the very best June ever. Um, so we're right in the middle of Dr. Hall's chart. We're kind of at break even for the year at this point. Uh, I think a lot of factors go into that. You know, we're primarily supermarket based. I think if you were um, in the, the big box uh, arena, I think you've done a little bit better. If you're selling a lot to retail, you've done quite a bit worse than that, at least in the United States. Um, let me see here. <clears throat> so, uh, again, switching to thrive mode, um, you know, we're also communicating that to our employees. Uh, I put here in red that the continued emphasis on hygiene, uh, I'm not, uh, we're talking to people all across the world, um, here in California, at least in much of the United States, there's been a real big rebound in cases here locally. And, uh, you know, we are just, again, really hammering on people to be smart, to, you know, our, our standards should not be what our government is communicating to us. Our standards should be what it takes to keep us safe. Um, I also personally believe uh, that, um, you know, we're, we can discuss the shape of the recovery. I think there's going to be many bumps. I think, uh, at least for us as a business, 
we cannot expect to keep going like we have been in, in June. I think we be, need to be prepared for another downturn, perhaps even more severe than the first time. So uh, we're maintaining a very strong cash position. We're stocking up on personal protective equipment and we're being cautious about any optional um, big cash outlays. Um, and again, as I'd already mentioned, we are gonna be focusing on new sales channels and social media going forward. Um, ultimately, I think we did a lot of things right. Um, I think I'd, I, I want at this point uh, take a, a moment to also acknowledge the role of, for lack of a better word, luck. Uh, we can do everything right. Um, and I think we are very fortunate in a lot of ways to be in a developed economy here in the United States uh, with very developed um, sales channels and, and uh, banking system and things like that, uh, that perhaps some other people in other parts of the world don't have. Um, but there's a lot of things we did right all the same. Um, I think I want to emphasize that, you know, we really did listen to our employees. We're communicating with them. Um, also, number six, patient and support with clients. I did see some of our competitors or colleagues out in the market get uh, getting aggressive and almost demanding with clients when POs were canceled. We felt that was extremely short-sighted. Uh, we'll see uh, if they actually pay for that. Um, but uh, yeah, overall, I think we did most things right. What could we have done better? Um, in retrospect, um, our hygiene protocol, we rolled it out really piecemeal as information was coming to us. And perhaps we should have been a little bit, uh, a day or two more patient and be more, bent more comprehensive with it. I think it caused some confusion for our employees. I think we should have been a little bit more flexible, as flexible for best case scenario. Uh, we didn't really anticipate a return to uh, a improved sales as quickly as we did. And we were caught shorthanded and understaffed and probably missed a couple of opportunities. And I think, you know, this last one was very challenging because a lot of customers went dark on us, frankly. But I think we should have been more persistent and communicating with those key accounts. Um, but again, overall, uh, you know, where, where we are today is uh, very, very far from the end of the road. I think Dr. Hall with his five R's, I would say we're very much still in the resilience mode um, and we're planning about return and reimagination. I think it would be a real mistake to think that we're further along in recovery than we are. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of work and a lot of danger still out there. Uh, but that's where Westerly is today. And I think that's my last slide. Yes, it is. So I'm going to go ahead and. Uh, Swan Fate, I, don't, very I'm, much I need to return the screen to you guys one second. Yeah, we'll do so. We'll do oh, so. Oh, you'll return it. Okay, thank you. No worries. I got one question. We got a small video that you sent us. We would like to share that with the audience. Yes. But you were talking about several steps. And the first step was the, the thrive mode. Uh, if I compare that, because there were quite some parallels between your presentation and the one that Mr. Hall uh, did, his fourth step in his model is reimagination. Do you think that any company after Corona can thrive without reimagination? Any company? Uh, I don't. I can only speak for ourselves. I, I feel like there's a lot we can do. Uh, there's a couple of major things that we can do differently that we're going to, that we've, we've learned some things um, that we're going to apply to the future. I, I'd put it that way. That's what it's, you know, uh, both being more, having a more robust, um, thoughtful social media uh, presence and um, developing an online sales channel. I think those are the big reimaginations for us, as well as you know, the way we work here in terms of hygiene and teams and uh, trying to work you know, for the folks to the sales team working remotely. I'd always been very adamant that salespeople have to be in the office. That's clearly old fashioned thinking that has been shaken out of me. Right. Thanks, uh, Tuan, so much for sharing uh, your experiences uh, in these difficult times. We uh, are going to the video, show that short video, and then we'll get back to you. Okay. Just for the audience, if you have any questions or if you uh, yeah, just want to get in touch with these people, let us know. Just uh, use the, the panel on the right hand side of your screen. But first, uh, as Renee said, let's start with the video. Hospitals patients are usually the ones to get flowers, but now an orchid farm in Santa Barbara is giving them to healthcare workers instead. Our community journalist Eric Resendez shows us the act of kindness that's just starting to blossom. More than 3,000 orchids from Santa Barbara County were given to medical staff at Keck Medical Center of USC in Boyle Heights. 
a gift to those who are at the front lines of the pandemic. So we just got these uh, wonderful flowers. Uh, we're so thankful on behalf of the uh, nurses at Keck and the community. Um, I'd just like to thank you guys. This delivery is one of five shipments sent to USC hospitals throughout the area. That's over 11,000 orchids, all coming from Westerly Orchids. So we've challenged ourselves to donate 100,000 orchids to nurses, doctors, and other hospital staff on the front lines who are fighting this pandemic. Tuan Overgog, the owner of the commercial orchid grower, says about 700,000 of these colorful orchids were initially grown to ship to supermarkets across the western U.S. This is usually their peak season with Easter and Mother's Day around the corner. Now with the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, we are looking at uh, lots of orchids uh, with very few sales. So our sales are about 25, 30 percent of normal. And so obviously from a business standpoint, that's pretty scary. Uh, but on the other hand, we're saying to ourselves, how do we make something positive out of this? And with this delivery happening at Keck Medicine USC, Tuan says this puts them at the 20,000 mark towards his 100,000 orchid challenge. On Holy Week, Passover, Holy Thursday, this is so special for staff to receive these flowers, springtime, and, and it's a new beginning and a glimmer of hope as we are in the thick of this COVID-19 crisis. So we're very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tuan. We'll get back to you later. Uh, but let's go to our final uh, speaker. Yes, one uh, question's coming in, but looking at the time, I think uh, let's go to Ari first. I have some questions on this video as well, but uh, let's save them for a little later. So we will, back, uh, we will be back Ari. after Ari's presentation. Ari van den Berg. Uh, Ari, your microphone is already working. Your camera is uh, not working yet, but we will see you soon. You're a rose grower. I think if you look at marketing, you're one of the few uh, marketeers, uh, floricultural marketeers that has used the ANSOF model in a, in a way that is for me incredible. The ANSOF model includes market penetration, market development, product development and diversification. And you do it all. You are you producing in the Netherlands, you are producing roses uh, in, in, in Kenya. You started in China with roses, but you grow other crops there as well for the local market. So from, from an ounce perspective, you are in the floricultural world, uh, pretty amazing. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, Tuan's camera is frozen at this moment, but I think you can see in, in here us, uh, Ari, is that correct? Uh, I can see you and hopefully uh, you can see me as well. We yeah, see you fine. We see you. So we will start right now with your presentation. So please go ahead. Yeah. So hello. My name is Ari van der Berg. I'm an owner of uh, Berg Roses. And as uh, at the top, you already uh, we have uh, farms in China, Kenya, and in Holland. I started in uh, Holland in uh, 1975. My, it's really family business and my father and my uncle started in 1975 with uh, growing roses. In uh, uh, 2004 we started a farm in, uh, in Kenya, Navasha. In 2007 we started a farm in uh, China, near Kunming, so uh, Yunnan province. So to uh, start with uh, China, uh, in January we were surprised by uh, uh, COVID-19. I was there, I think, the second week of January. Uh, and uh, let's say in uh, the Chinese New Year holiday uh, season, uh, COVID hits China very hard. It was in the Wuhan, what is about 1,500 kilometers from our farm. But it becomes a completely lockdown. Also, the, the flower market was closed, so uh, sales dropped enormously for, for quite a while, but we were focused on the direct sales. So uh, what we saw on our farm is that uh, uh, direct sales continues, 
only prices drop around a lot. And normally uh, February is our month where we make the highest turnover because of, uh, first of all, normally Chinese New Year, Valentine, and the sales of International Women's Day. And uh, in China, we grow roses and tulips as well. And mainly for tulips, uh, February is our uh, month with, with the peak. So the peak in the production and the peak in, uh, in the prices. So that, that all drops down and that affects us a lot. So let's say from uh, the 1st of January till, uh, uh, let's say the end of uh, April, our turnover drops with 20%. We didn't throw any flowers, but uh, so we could sell them, but for for very low prices. In uh, in China, it was impossible to uh, uh, to move to travel from one village to another village. Luckily, uh, most of our employees uh, come from uh, the, the 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 village where we have the farm but especially the managers who visit the families during the Chinese New Year weren't allowed to travel back to the, the village where we have our farm. And also uh, the Dutch managers, so the, the general manager, the sales manager, and the production manager couldn't travel. Uh, if they travel, they need to be in quarantine for uh, two weeks. So our uh, production manager normally uh, travel up and down from uh, Chiang Mai, Thailand, where he lived with his family. So normally it's, let's say, 10 days on the farm, five days at his family. And at this time, he is already for, uh, for more than three months on our farm. So uh, before Valentine, he came to the farm uh, and still on the farm and couldn't go back to his family in Chiang Mai. So that is really, yeah strange uh, situation for the management so as well the Dutch management but uh, also in February it was for them uh, the Chinese managers impossible to, to travel uh, inside China uh, and for me and uh, let's say uh, since 2003 I'm traveling the world around between Holland Kenya and China and uh, now for me it's impossible to, uh, to travel so uh, we have a lot of uh, meetings by Skype or uh, Teams or, uh, or other things. And uh, a lot of reports on email, what I need to read. Uh, but yes, it, it doesn't feel good to, uh, to, to don't be that long on the farms. Um, yeah, also a strange situation. Uh, in January, I bought a lot of uh, mouth masks in Holland about 20,000 to send to uh, to China for protecting uh, our employees. But before they arrived, let's say that the problem in Holland was bigger than uh, it was in China. So uh, after uh, two months or let's say one month, we sent it back from uh, China to Holland and we donated it to uh, local hospitals in Holland because they didn't have any. So, yeah, that shows that uh, we didn't expect, first of all, the problem in China, but uh, when it hits China, I didn't expect it would go, uh, it would be a worldwide problem, uh, and especially not in, uh, in Europe. So, uh, about Holland, uh, it was about uh, the, the 12th of March when the prices on the market really drops down and the market for us means the, the Floral Holland uh, auction. Let's say it, uh, it started on a Thursday uh, when there wasn't a market and let's say on a Friday there wasn't any market at all. So let's say almost 100% of our flowers we had to throw. Uh, during that weekend, we make a plan how to survive a period of 12 weeks with a turnover of 20% on our Dutch farm. Because what we saw was that uh, uh, borders were closed, so there wasn't any exports. And what we produce in Holland is, let's say, for 95% is for export. Uh, in 
immediately we decide to uproot uh, 25 percent of our greenhouses so normally uh, you have a, a rose crop for uh, let's say eight till ten years and we had plans for 2021 and 2022 to uproot four hectares but we uh, decided to do this in uh, in April uh, 2020 because yes, uh, it was sure that uh, 2020 wouldn't be a good year. So uh, uh, we really want to fight for 2021 and 2022 to have a good year. So to take all the the uh, the, the, uh, the new crops in uh, 2020. And that, that was a good decision. We decided to uproot a white variety called Avalanche. And uh, yeah, the market is recovered. Uh, later on, I will uh, explain why. But still, uh, white flowers are not really favorite because there are no weddings, there are no events. And normally, uh, white flowers are used a lot uh, for weddings and, uh, and events. What we see on the other hand is that internet sales was three times what it was before, especially the first weeks during the, the COVID period. Uh, the, it was extremely high. So clients of Better Roses who do internet sales where uh, the orders never been that high. Um, about the, the auction. Uh, the Florida Holland gave us restrictions uh, to put the flowers on the auction. So let's say that the first weeks we were allowed to uh, put 20% or 30% of our production of the year before on the Flora auction uh, clocks. That helped us, that helped us because uh, we had, let's say, not good prices, but at least we could sell some of our products. Uh, later on, it was uh, the restrictions were be more flexible and uh, in a couple of uh, weeks, it was uh, close to 100%. But the reason for this was that there was a big problem uh, with the imported uh, roses, uh, especially from, uh, from Kenya because there was not enough capacity of air freight. So uh, the Dutch growers could sell the products, but the international growers, they didn't have uh, air freight or they had a lockdown on the, uh, the farm. So let's say the, the, the Dutch roses were in favor uh, with reasonable prices. And later on, uh, when uh, uh, the Dutch mother days comes, the prices were even very good or better than the years before. Uh, in Holland, uh, we are producing roses for the wholesale. And what we also saw that was direct sales went up extremely uh, because the, the wholesale didn't want to have any risks. So during the morning, they put the orders uh, uh, direct to the growers instead of uh, uh, taking the flowers from the auction clock. Uh, that had to be with risk, but also with availability because we were just allowed to put, let's say, 20 or 30% of uh, our flowers on the, the market, on the auction clock. So what we now also see is that the cooperation between wholesale and uh, uh, the growers is more close than it was before the COVID-19. Um, May and also June now is very, very, very good, uh, but that is just because there is there aren't enough uh, flowers on the market. I'm just talking about roses, but what you see with other products, for example, chrysanthemums or lily, uh, ro uh, growers, they didn't put 100% of their production, so they didn't put the young plants or the bulbs on the soil and there now are uh, less uh, flowers available than in a normal uh, year without COVID. 
So there is really a big difference between uh, the products if the prices are good or not good. But for what I can say for the roses, the prices are really good on the market. Uh, in Holland, we do get the financial support of the government. Uh, the government reacts quite fast, so that really helps us. And in the other countries, Kenya and China, we aren't helped by the, by the government. Uh, Kenya. In Kenya, we produce for the retail, so let's say the supermarkets in the northern part of uh, Europe. Uh, when COVID starts, I didn't expect that much problems for my Kenyan farm because it's a year round contract with year round prices. And what you saw that the supermarkets were quite busy with selling uh, all kinds of products. Only what we uh, uh, what problems we face in the first weeks is that also some countries, uh, some supermarkets in let's say Swiss or Austria weren't allowed to sell flowers because the, the, the flower shops were closed. So uh, the government decided that uh, the supermarkets were also not allowed to sell flowers. Also supermarkets decided to stop with selling flowers because of the capacity they need all the space and uh, the trucks to uh, provide the, the shops with, um, let's say, foods, uh, fruits, etc. Uh, so at the beginning, let's say we had the flowers in Holland, but we didn't have the market. So we need to throw, uh, let's say, 20% of our production in Kenya. Later on, the, that the market recovered, so supermarkets sold the flowers or even more than 100% of the flowers. But at that, that time, air freight becomes a problem. Uh, when there wasn't a market for flowers, uh, planes uh, uh, stopped with a freight of flowers from Nairobi to, to, uh, to Holland, Germany or the UK. When it recovered, they had new lines on China or South Africa or wherever for, for other goods than the flowers. So before Mother Day, there wasn't enough capacity and uh, they fight to get more capacity. But then the price doubled. So normally, let's say we pay around uh, two uh, dollar a kg, and at that time, so the period of the mother day, we need to pay uh, four dollar per kg. So and still, that isn't recovered. So nowadays, we let pay, let's say, um, fifteen percent more than what it should be in a normal year. Uh, yeah, and in Kenya. Uh, the COVID is also uh, coming up, uh, so uh, a problem for me to go there and a problem uh, for the, my local uh, managers, uh, because one of them is in, in Holland, can go back. And of course, uh, the, the, our employees in Kenya, we have many, about the 1,300. We all take them by bus. Uh, to have one and a half meter in the buses with the mouth masks, that is already a challenge. And to make them aware of the risk of uh, COVID is uh, really a headache. So that is, is in short, uh, the, the problems we face is in China, Holland and, uh, and Kenya. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ari. We had a slight challenge here to uh, manage your slides, but uh, I hope in the end uh, everything was uh, clear to the audience um, the presentation is also uh, in the handout section uh, so people can download it to uh, go over it again. Um, as, as we are coming now to the, to the, questions, uh, to the questions part, uh, uh, going to you and uh, maybe Tuan and uh, Dr. Hall can join us. Uh, also, um, a few a few questions from the audience, but but maybe to start with you, uh, Ari, um, so you've been hit three times uh, by the crisis, uh, so to say, first in China, then the Netherlands uh, and Kenya. 
Um, how, how does it look for you now? Um, looking at uh, what Dr. Hall was explaining, the, the various stages uh, where companies are in, um, do you feel, uh, what stage for each company do you feel that, that you're at now? Yeah, first of all, uh, I have uh, three farms in three different countries to spread risks, so never had the idea that uh, uh, a problem can uh, face uh, or, yeah, the three farms. So, but for Holland nowadays, I think we uh, we have the feeling that it becomes more local for local. So uh, nowadays we have 75% of our production, but almost 100% of our turnover. So the prices are really, really good. Last week it was terrible hot, and even with uh, with this weather, uh, the prices were good. So I have the feeling that the coming weeks, months would be better than the years before for Holland, for Holland. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenya, I think it will take months or even years before the air freight will be back to normal because there are, uh, there are no passenger flights to Africa and normally they take also uh, air freight. So uh, for the coming years, my expectation is that air freight will be much more expensive than it was the years before. So, and 35% of our costs is air freight. So, um, maybe we need to focus more on uh, transport by uh, by sea. So, containers uh, uh, with ULO. Um, and further on, yes, uh, normally, let's say, uh, Africa, if Africa will really be hit with uh, Corona, yeah, then uh, it will be hit more hard than uh, China and uh, Europe, in my opinion. So um, the most of our worries I have is about Kenya. That is yeah. connected to a question we get from uh, Lorena Luna from Guatemala. You, that, that is exactly what, what, what you are in fact, uh, answering right now. Does that have to do with the fact that there's more government support in, uh, in Europe, but also in China than in countries of, 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 uh, like Kenya? Mm, of course, the government support helps a lot, but in, on the other end, Holland have uh, extremely high costs. So if you don't have turnover, but you need to have your stuff. So uh, uh, if you're not allowed to send employees away, then the problem in Holland is, let's say, the, the biggest cost in Holland is employees, right. labor. Uh, so uh, normally, without uh, income in Kenya, you can survive much longer than in Holland. No. Charlie, question for you. This is all about reimagination. Let's just reimagine uh, your your position in this world. You're a professor. We 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 are we are used to learn from you. What what have you learned from these guys? <laughs> well, number one, you need to have a crisis management plan in place. Mm -hmm. right? and we so many companies were caught unaware that they didn't have a plan in place, so they had to develop some new SOPs, uh, standard operating procedures. And and um, they they were very creative and resilient in developing those SOPs, but uh, the real question is how many of those SOPs will become permanent, or will they simply fall away until the next crisis? So that that's one thing. Secondly, I think uh, in terms of transportation, the the entire transportation industry is being it's just in a state of upheaval. And we're going to see profitability of airlines continue to diminish. Um, the 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 what it, what we'll we'll see different structural um, relationships between the airlines and their vendors. And I think we'll see some long-term contracts develop out of that. We usually see uh, firms wanting to mitigate risk through time. And so I think the way in which we contract with airline and trucking services will, will change. And I think the way that those entities operate will also change and they'll, we'll, we'll all consider risk more as a factor. Now, thirdly, I think that uh, for Aerie and uh, the, the, the whole nature of the auction system has been changing over the last decade and a half anyway. 
And what will be interestingly uh, interesting to see is how the Dutch auction system will continue to metamorphosize in the in the wake of COVID and the role that it will play in the future versus what it has in the past. So I think I look forward to those structural change. Well, I don't look forward to them. I, I, I look forward to seeing how this is going to play out. Anybody who has a crystal ball right now and says, I know exactly how this is going to play out. You don't want to listen to them because there's a, there's a great deal of uncertainty that's in the marketplace. However, Warren Buffett so, would tell us that there's conclude. a great deal of opportunity in the midst of uncertainty. Well, Charlie, is it fair to conclude that what we've seen now, internet sales, direct sales are increasing? Um, will that be the tendency? Is this, is, uh, let, let's go to Ari uh, maybe to uh, to, to uh, respond on that. What, will, what, what Mr. Hall was saying, Ari, about the auctions, I, what, just in a few words, what, 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 what's the impact of COVID on chain? on the worldwide chain? Uh, first of all, uh, many things are changed uh, during the COVID-90 period, but the uh, auction didn't change anything. Uh, they, they want to keep it like it was. Uh, but what we see is that uh, a wholesale uh, is also struggling. Uh, they're becoming bigger and bigger. Uh, they cooperate, they cooperate with each other, but they also cooperate with uh, the growers. So, uh, in my opinion, growers should be more the partners of the, the wholesale, especially for the wholesale, but, but also the retail, but retail was already not uh, uh, on the auction for the re retail product. No. So, uh, what, 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 what becomes more and more uh, direct contact uh, and uh, the, the, the clock in the the first weeks there wasn't any market, so the, the prices were let's say uh, a couple of cents. But now on the other end, it's extremely high. So uh, 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 and uh, for the if I talk about the roses, it's more a dump market. So if there is overproduction, they put it all on the the clock. But if there is any shortage. And now there is a shortage because there isn't uh, enough capacity of air freight. Then uh, on the other end, it's extremely high. And uh, I think they also cannot work with this kind of prices. Tuan, from your perspective, you, you've you been used to work without an auction. I mean, you're in California. You always did uh, your sales directly to wholesalers, to brokers, etc. But you concluded that you've you had to learn a lot based on COVID, on social media, maybe even internet sales. What, what do you expect about uh, changes in the chain? Well, we can't hear you. Sorry, this- You have me maybe. muted. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. sorry there sorry. we go, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I expect for us just the nature of our product, it's something that's relatively bulky. It's something that um, doesn't lend itself to being shipped single shipper in a box, um, the, the, the volume vel uh, relative to the value, orchids, um, roses can be shipped, for example, cut flowers generally, uh, pack them very tight, ship them relatively efficiently, um, single shippers. Orchids, less so, so online, direct online sales are, are tougher. Um, the, the, the shipping is gonna be two, three times as much often as the plant itself. Um, I think one thing that uh, we're anticipating a lot of, however, and we're trying to figure out how to build our business around is um, the Instacart model, where people are ordering online and having it picked up at a grocery store or perhaps even a distribution center for a right. grocery store. And how do we create a product? How do we package our product to fit within that? That's actually yeah. something we've been working on uh, for six, seven months. So preceding the crisis, trying to get some of our biggest customers to the table, like how can we pack it? How can we market it online? Because we've seen the growth. Uh, we already saw the potential of that and the and the growth in that. And of course, this is only accelerating that. Um, in terms of uh, more online sales ourselves, we're, we're trying to create a model. Uh, we think we think there's a model to 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 ship to wholesale. Now the the retail business, whether it's florists, garden centers, or event planners, uh, folks who might use our product. In that context, we think there's a market to sell to them directly online. We'd be able to reach out to them and 
I think about Holland, you know, I go to the, the water drinker website and uh, there's a couple of other ones as well uh, that don't spring to mind that just, you tell me what you want in an orchid, what color, what size, any kind of plant, you can get it wholesale that way. And can we create sort of an online marketplace like that uh, here? And that's something that we're, we're thinking about. Uh, it's, a, it's a major undertaking and you kind of have to create that market. But I think when you see what's happened here uh, with the with the crisis that, um, you know, you gotta try something because we were absolutely cut off for um, a couple of weeks from from, from all market. And um, that even does, doesn't touch, you asked about social media as well. So if I say a word or two about that, that <clears throat> realizing, you know, we have, I think two and a half thousand followers on our Instagram account. Uh, there's a furniture store across the road that has, 40,000 followers, you know, it's a, it's, it's a local furniture store. So you realize the, and I looked around, uh, none of my direct competitors in the United States have more than 10,000 followers, I think. And so you realize we're just, we're missing something very obvious. We're missing a, a way to build a brand and to communicate directly with the people who care about your product and tell them why they should care about your product and tell them what you're doing um, and get them to seek out your product in whatever channel it is that you're putting it in. And so we're, we're absolutely recognizing that opportunity. Charlie. <laughs> yeah, let, me, let me jump in and tag on what Twan just said. Um, and I think it's reflective of the fact that we're going to get better at utilizing B2B and B2C technologies in general. And uh, particularly things like AI, artificial intelligence. We've only scratched the surface within the, the nursery floral industry in terms of the applications of AI. And I think we'll utilize that to facilitate some of these supply chain linkages. And a, another thought about that is that many of the changes we're talking about were in process. And COVID-19 simply accelerated the process. Things that we thought were gonna be take us three, four or five years to get accomplished, all of a sudden we found we could do them in three or four or five weeks. Exactly. When, the, when it really came down to it. So I think we'll start seeing those changes. And I noticed one question that came in from the audience was, do we anticipate the, the increase in sales, the temporary increase in sales that we saw this spring to continue post COVID? Yeah. And I, I think I'll jump right in because historically, when we have seen recessions worldwide, our industry, the being horticulture has benefited from both fruits and vegetables and the ornamentals cut flower side. And in the short run, when people are staying at home more and traveling less to Disney or taking vacations, they're, they're staying at home, they, they're doing their staycations at home. They're wanting to spruce up their environment, make it more attractive. And so in the short run, we see those sales increase. It's not until the recovery starts and consumers start purchasing durable goods, cars, refrigerators, furniture, um, vacations, that, that and those kinds of things, that we see a slight drop in green industry sales. So we, have, we know that's probably coming. We need to be prepared for it. Maybe that'll be, um, that wave will, will continue until maybe next spring and we'll have another great spring. We'll see how that plays out. But that's historically, We've seen a big push and then a slight drop, and then we start rising again in the wake of any sort of economic downturn. Thanks, uh, Charlie. Uh, a quick question actually for you, or maybe for uh, Tim of AIPH is, um, if there's already any um, results of, of research available that compares the impact of COVID in the different continents, and uh, if you have that available, then um, uh, we can also uh, get you in touch directly with the uh, audience, so the, the, the person in the audience who asked the question. So that's good to know. Well, AIPH has already generated data, so I'll turn that question over to Tim. He's going to knock yeah. a home run here because he, he, he has exactly what they're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, we're also going to the end of this session, so uh, so indeed, if uh, your website is a place to go for uh, growers and other professionals to find comparative information, that would be great. Uh, but also looking at the time, uh, a few last questions. 
uh, are coming in, but uh, we also need to uh, to wind up. Okay, well, uh, I would uh, say certainly we have information about comparing the impact in different countries. If you go to our website, the Coronavirus Resource Centre, there has uh, documents which detail all the different... So we did two surveys, one early on in the crisis and one uh, more recently, and actually it's very interesting to notice the shift in tone as you move from uh, the start where, it, where everyone was looking at disaster and shifting to a position of much uh, a more positive outlook. Um, so I would just like to take the opportunity to uh, thank all of you um, today, to, uh, again to Ed and Rene for their organising, but especially to our speakers, to Charlie, to Tuan and to Ari for the really insightful um, uh, talks today. I think we've all learned a lot from this. Um, it's interesting to see how the best practice is following the pattern that uh, Charlie laid out in his presentation. It's interesting to see the move to the more online, which is likely to embed as a change into the future, the importance of the use of social media, the emphasis on uh, the health of staff and the priority of people. The people are your core resource, which you have focused on caring for. Um, interesting to hear about the change that we may see in the relationship between the grower and the wholesaler, uh, especially in the Netherlands. Um, uh, interesting how we will deal with transport in the future, uh, maybe a shift for flowers from uh, air to sea a bit more and maybe a speeding up of technologies in these areas and alternative routes. Uh, but fundamentally, I see an optimistic view of the future, but mixed with a little bit of caution, taking it uh, step by step uh, and uh, being careful for businesses that are able to pull through this, are the ones that really got a hold of the issue at the early stages, got a hold of their business and made the difficult, hard decisions quickly and then uh, were able to uh, put themselves in place with a clear plan for the future. Great to see the kind of goal setting right the way from the beginning of the crisis, even goals on how many orchids you can give away. So it was really uh, uh, fantastic to see all of those things. So um, from my perspective, uh, it's been a great time and I hope um, the audience has enjoyed it too. I hope that we will be able to do these again for you and uh, we would very much like to and uh, we will keep you updated on that. Please subscribe to uh, FCI if you haven't already. It doesn't cost anything to do so and we produce it for you and to support the industry. Um, and thanks again to Green Tech for their promotion. Um, maybe it'll be the first international event you can actually come to in person, but that'll be in 20th of from the 20th of October in the Netherlands as well. So uh, thanks again, and uh, I pass back to you, Rene, uh, and uh, wish everyone all the best as they continue to come through this crisis. Thank you, uh, Tim, for your kind words. We're just gonna uh, close down this, um, this session and uh, we hope to see you again. It was a pleasure. And uh, thank you, have a good evening, rest bye, of the morning, you. rest of the day. Bye from Costa Rica. Ciao. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.